Beliefs about vampires, werewolves, witches, and wizards are widespread. Exactly what is a serial killer? Our house uh, was two rooms, and there was seven of us. He held the bat like this. That's why I have characters who sort of expose themselves. And everybody always say, Coach Carter, Samuel Jackson is taller than you. I said, I know, but I think I'm better looking. Thanks everyone for being here, also for the fact that this is not going to be an easy discussion. Right, we're going to be talking about issues of extreme racism, of the brutality of the slave trade, and of the ways in which Anglo-European white cultures have traditionally interacted with black and brown cultures around the world in the age of imperialism. So it's a tough discussion. Now, I was, I was thinking about how to frame the discussion for today, too, and I was really struck by the idea that it often seems to take some terrible event, right, some unspeakable atrocity to, to rouse us from the complacency of our everyday lives, right, to, to shock us out of our stasis. And most recently, I think we can look to what happened with the murder of George Floyd, which sparked widespread support for the Black Lives Matter movement, not just in this country, but in 60 countries around the world. And then further back in our history, we can think about the, uh, the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s. You know, there's terrible violence being committed against African-American people across the South, and yet it took a bloody crescendo of that violence in Selma, Alabama, before the rest of the nation stood up and took action against the injustices that were happening all around them and in support of African-American voting rights. And then even further back than that, we can look at the boiling over of tensions about slavery that resulted in a civil war in this country and, and dealt with the fundamental issue of who has access to the basic human right of freedom. And when we think about that question as to where the paradigm started to shift, at what point did white Anglo-American societies start to see black African societies in particular not as commodities to be bought and traded, but as human beings instead. And for that, we have to go back to our colonial roots. We have to go back to Great Britain and the birth of the abolition movement in that country. And what we can look at here, too, is another atrocity that sparks this. And it was something so shocking that it stunned Britons into an understanding that something has to change. And that atrocity was the Zong Massacre. Now, this is going to be the thing that in the 1780s will kick off the abolition movement and begin this slow 20-year grind towards abolition of the slave trade in 1807, and then eventually in 1830s, abolition of slavery itself in the British Empire. But it takes a long while to get there. And so I just want to be clear, too, that this isn't an argument about African victimization and white efforts to ameliorate the problem, right? Because the fact is that black men and women on both sides of the Atlantic, both enslaved and free, also had tremendous agency in feeding into this abolition movement and bringing about their own freedom. And eventually what would be, would be a tide of change in thought that would wash across the Atlantic world over the course of the 19th century. So. The story will begin on a British slave ship called the Zong. Now, she was a small vessel, about 110 tons. So that means she was about 70 to 80 feet long, maybe 25 feet wide. And she's going to begin her, her trip from Ghana on the African coast to Jamaica on August 18 of 1781, with 17 crew and 442 Africans enslaved on board. Now, that means she was packed about twice as many uh, captives on board this vessel as what would normally have been carried on a ship of that size. And uh, these people were then, of course, going to be packed in far tighter than what was normally uh, spaces allocated for captives on board slave ships, which was roughly 16 inches of shoulder space per person. So on the Zong, it's going to be a lot less than that. Now, 
the men and the boys on this voyage were actually separated. They would be uh, confined below the decks of the ship. The women and the children were put on a cage on the exposed deck of the vessel. And uh, that's where they would be left for the duration of this voyage. Now, if the Zong is the most infamous ship in slave trading history, then this vessel pictured here, the Brooks, is a close second. And what you're looking at here is 423 captives on board a vessel that was two and a half times larger in tonnage than the Zong. So there's more people on board the Zong, and she's two and a half times smaller than what is shown here. So when we look at the cross-section of the brooks, then you see the ways in which slave traders were often adding additional decks in the tween spaces so that they could fit more bodies aboard. And to give it a sense of scale, the distance between the, the tween decks here is two foot seven inches. So that's not even enough room to properly sit up for an average man. And then when we think about the spaces here, the whole idea that enough room would be given for a person to lie flat on the deck is absurd. That almost never happened because slave traders are always thinking about how they can pack more people into the vessel. And the way this was done, the term of art that was used by slave traders was to put people in spoon-wise. And this is a reference to how you would pack spoons in a drawer to make sure they all fit. And one way that this could be done is, as you see in this illustration, by putting people on their sides and crooking them and then laying them head to toe. Another definition of spoon-wise is maybe even more insidious, and this involves sitting people down on the deck, spreading their legs, and then slotting someone in between those legs, and then they open their legs, and so on and so on. So if you want to lie down here, your only option is to lay down on the bellies of the people behind you. Now, this is a pretty grim reality to think about, especially when we think about the fact that this overcrowded situation is going to lead to even more cruel conditions. Because what it means is that the ratio of enslaved people to the crew is very high. On the Zong, we're looking at about one crewman for every 26 captives. Uh, standard was about one for every nine to 10 captives. And so what it meant was that it increased the chance of some sort of insurrection, of a rebellion going on aboard. And this was the greatest fear, of course, of every slave trading crew member. They were worried about the insurrections. And in fact, this is what uh, uh, one of the illustrations of how this was dealt with, uh, which was to put up a barricade to separate the uh, quarter deck from the area that would have probably been taken over by enslaved people in rebellion. And of course, the quarter deck was where you had all of your small arms. So the muskets, the, the uh, pistols, and the swivel guns, which would have been then trained on the uprising. And of course, most of these uprisings were put down very violently. Now, it seems that it was quite regular to have uh, some sort of a mass rebellion on board these vessels. It's estimated that one in every 10 slave voyagers actually uh, saw a form of a rebellion. But obviously, uh, very few were actually successful. Now, this overcrowding situation meant that the men and the boys who were going to be shackled below the decks uh, would not be given daily spells or every few days be allowed to come up on the deck to stretch their legs or take fresh air. And this did happen on a number of vessels, on quite a lot of them. But when you're in an overcrowded situation, you can't do that out of the risk of an insurrection coming. So it means that they would be shackled below the deck for the duration of the voyage. Now that duration, the time it took to get from the West African coast, which normally there were multiple stops, and to come across to the Americas, on average took between 30 and 70 days. And it varied depending on you know, where you left in Africa, where your destination was in the Americas, and of course the conditions that the ship faced in its crossing. Now, keep in mind, too, that these slave vessels took on captives in small batches. They would make lots of stops along the coast to take on five, maybe ten uh, captives at a time. So it could take five to six months 
of people being on board in these very confined situations before they even left the coast of Africa. And for the Zong, it was even worse because she had been captured as a Dutch slaver in 1781. And keep in mind, in 1781, the American Revolutionary War has exploded into a worldwide conflict. And the Dutch and the French and the Americans are all allied against Great Britain at this point. So when the Dutch slave ship was captured, it was, it was a fair prize from the Royal Navy. And she was a very valuable prize because she had on board already 200 captives. Now, we don't know how long they had been there, but best estimates are that it was maybe upwards of a year. So you can imagine the, the condition that these people were in after such a long confinement. So now we have 442 people on board in conditions which were already deplorable, and as soon as the journey begins, it gets far worse. And because the men and the boys were shackled below and never allowed up on deck for fear of a mutiny, it meant that they ate and they drank and they urinated and defecated and vomited from seasickness and from other diseases where they lay. And the effects of this on the health of all the captives below was, was catastrophic. Uh, dysentery was rampant. Uh, there were serious threats that typhoid was going to break out, sepsis and gangrene from the constant wearing of the, the shackles on bare flesh was infecting nearly every member of the captives that was below deck. Within two days, it was reported, human waste had filled the hold. And on this voyage, like many of the other more overcrowded ones, it was never emptied. And the result was that by the middle of November, when the vessel is approaching the Leeward Islands, these are the Leeward Island chains here, the southern end of it, 62 people had already died from disease. So it was a pretty uh, devastating voyage even up to this point. There were also uh, many of the crew who were really sick as well. They were down to about 11 functional crew members at this point. So 360 enslaved people still alive and 11 functional crew members. And it's a, a reality that's made a lot worse when you think about the fact that the Zong did not make her crossing in 30 days or 70 days, she took 126 days to reach Jamaica, which is insane. So why did the journey take so long? Well, much comes down to uh, the fact that her captain, Luke Collingwood, uh, was not a licensed seaman. He was actually a licensed surgeon who had been uh, a surgeon on many slave voyages, and, but this was his first voyage where he would actually be a captain of the ship. So he really wasn't an experienced navigator or seaman. So there's problems there. But the other thing is that he gets sick. He gets infected by various diseases that are happening on the voyage, and he will become so sick that, in fact, he dies a few weeks after reaching Jamaica. He's fatally ill. So whether he was in a state of delirium when uh, an... The, the 14th of November, the ship is right about here. It's approaching Tobago. He has a falling out with the second in command of the vessel. And that was a man named James Kelsall. And um, this man was a, an experienced navigator, an experienced sailor. But with this argument that they had, he is removed from his position. And he is effectively confined to his cabin for the rest of the voyage. So that begs the question, well, if the captain's incapacitated and the second in command is confined to his cabin, who's in command of the ship? And it seems that before he took to his cabin, Captain Collingwood had assigned a passenger on board the Zong with the duties of command. Now, it was really unusual to have a passenger on a slave ship because the conditions were generally horrific. But this man, his name was uh, Stubbs, Robert Stubbs, had been a captain of a slave vessel 20 years before. But more recently, he had been serving as the colonial governor of this fort, Fort William, which was the British slave trading fort at Anamabu on the coast of Ghana. Now, just to give you an idea of what is going on on the coast of Ghana at this time, this is just a small section of the coastline, and each one of these names is an embarkation point or a fort where enslaved people can be brought aboard ships. So you can see the extent of the operation that just the British have going in this small section of the coast here. 
And uh, right at the center is the Cape Coast Castle. And that's what it looks like, what's left of it today. It's a, it's a museum to commemorate the lives that were lost in Middle Passage. Um, but the Cape Coast Castle was the hub of the Royal Africa Company and where they centered all of their operations. This is an official state-sponsored slave trading company, okay, based right there. And then the Anamabo uh, Fort was just a, a little ways up the coast. So when the ship leaves the port of Anamabu, they will touch down in Benin and take on additional uh, enslaved people. And then they will head over to Sao Tome. And Sao Tome is the island where they will take on their last supplies, food and water, before they begin their, their voyage across the Atlantic. And so it's at the tail end of that Atlantic voyage that Stubbs is taking over. Now the key thing about him is he was a total incompetent. Um, he had just been fired from his position at the Fort William, uh, and he was fired because there had been so many petitions coming back to London that he was completely incompetent, that he was illiterate, that he was innumerate, and that he was a drunk to boot. And finally, the government removes him from this position and takes him out of his job. And so Stubbs was taking the first available boat out of Anamabo, and that just happened to be the Zong. Now, it seems that while he was in command, there are a number of critical mistakes that are made on board the vessel. And the first one was to do with the water supply. Now, the water is kept in these big barrels, these casks in the hold of the ship. And this is an image of the, the hold with the water barrels on HMS Victory. This is a, a warship that is, I don't know, 30 times bigger than the Zong, right? So it's got fairly large overhead in the space here. It's fairly tall. But on the Zong, the overhead space in the hold would have been between four and five feet. It would have been pitch black. And keep in mind, too, that by this stage of the voyage, it would have been filled with human waste. So this is not a job for volunteers to go and check the water barrels. But finally, on the 21st of November, someone is sent to go and have a look. And what they find is that enormous amounts of water have leaked, okay? That they are actually in real trouble with the water that they have on board to complete their voyage. And uh, what should have happened here is that everyone on board, the, the, the crew and the captives, should have immediately been placed on half water rations at least. But that didn't happen. So it's a sign of ineptitude uh, in Stubbs in his command role here. Now the second mistake, and here we have them right around this position on the chart uh, on the 21st, the second mistake is a navigational error as they're approaching the island of Jamaica. And what happens here is that on the 27th or 28th of November, they spot land and what they think what they are actually looking at is the, the eastern end of Jamaica. But they were wrongly positioned on their charts on the ship. And so what they, they believed they were looking at was the western end of Saint-Domingue, which was French-held territory and therefore enemy territory. And they panic and they're like, oh my gosh, we have to get away from this coastline or we could be attacked by, by French privateers, by French naval ships that are in the area. So they turn away. They turn sharp to the southwest, and what this means is that within a few days, they are 120 miles off course, and they've already got a really serious water problem on board. Now, to answer this problem that they finally realize they have in, in terms of their position, they bring back Kelsall to command, and when he assesses the situation, what he decides is that there's only four days' water left for what could be a 10 to 14 day voyage to Jamaica, in worst case scenario. And then the nightmare began for the 360 remaining Africans on board. Because on November 29, 54 women and children were thrown overboard to their deaths. And it was done quietly. It was done at night. They were thrown individually through a rear port of the ship and into the ocean. Now, they, they did this, obviously, not to rile up the men who, if they'd heard these reactions, might have, have come and raised a rebellion. But that wasn't the end of it, because on December 1st, they threw a second group of enslaved men this time overboard, uh, 42 of them all up, and this was done in broad daylight from the quarterdeck, 
So everyone on board would have known what was happening. They would have heard the screams. They would have known exactly what was going on. And there's evidence of this because later on when Kelsall gives testimony, um, he says that one of the Africans on board had some English and actually came to him and begged for the lives of the remaining captives, saying, look, we will forego food and water until we reach our destination. Please just let us live. So it was obviously a, a really terrifying situation. And then sometime around maybe December 2nd, an incredible thing happened. It rained, and it rained really hard to the point that it refilled the water barrels and really cured the, the biggest problem that was facing the ship, which was the shortage of water. But the killings didn't stop because a few days later, 38 men were thrown from the ship. And in fact, another 10 who were terrified about what was to happen to them and decided that they would rather take their own lives than be thrown overboard jumped to their own deaths. So they committed suicide. So all up here, we have 132 men, women, and children who've been murdered aboard the Zong. Now, on December 22nd, the ship arrived in Jamaica with 208 Africans on board. Now, if you're doing the math, what that means is that another 36 had died either of disease or of other causes that are unspecified between the last of the killings and reaching Jamaica. And even the Jamaican newspapers, who were very well accustomed to seeing the terrible state of slave ships arriving in the island uh, and the terrible condition of the people on board, well, they were horrified. You know, there, there are these shocking stories that, that are coming out. Now, unfortunately, I would like to say that this case of the Zong and the murders that took place was an exceptional story, and that's why we know about it. Well, that, unfortunately, is not the case. Okay? The murder of Africans was commonplace during the slave trading age. They were thrown overboard alive for being sick, for being rebellious, or simply because the supplies on the ship were running out. But what made the story of the Zong stand out was because of what happened next. Now, in 1783, so two years after these events, the owners of the Zong, the, the Gregson Syndicate, which was a massive slave trading operation based in Liverpool, and Liverpool was the hub of British slave trading at the time, decided that they were going to file an insurance claim. An insurance claim for the 132 people that were lost at the value of 30 pounds a head. That's a lot of money in the 1780s. Just to put it in some sort of perspective, uh, an average able seaman, like a competent able seaman, professional sailor in the Royal Navy might have earned 24 pounds a year. Okay, so it's a lot of money that they're asking for. And what they're claiming is that this was cargo, and these are the terms that are used, claiming that it was cargo that had to be jettisoned to save the ship. Uh, that there were perils of the sea involved, and that legal phrase is going to entitle the Gregsons to compensation from their insurance because enslaved people who died from disease were considered part of natural attrition and they were not claimable. But if the ship was in danger because of being in bad conditions at sea or because of circumstances that happened at sea that they had no influence over, well then that was part of a legitimate claim. So these 132 Africans are going to be claimed just like other inanimate cargo, like barrels of sugar. Now, the claim was challenged by the insurers, and uh, what ended up happening was a court case coming out of it. And it was a case that came before the highest judge in England, the Lord Chief Justice, this guy Earl Mansfield. Now, it was a jury case with Mansfield presiding, and what the jury found was in favor of the Gregson Syndicate. They decided that the insurers had to pay up. Um, and uh, this was going to be a, a case that the judge would have to explain in the course of the hearing. He would have to give a justification for why the jury had come up with this, uh, d this decision. And what he explains is that, uh, yes, it was very shocking indeed, but when you look at the... Um, legal uh, languages that are involved in all of this. Uh, it was very shocking, he said, but the case was very much the same as if horses had been thrown overboard. Okay, so this, 
argument, this language that's being used, even to Britons who are quite inured to the language of slavery, is actually quite shocking. And, you know, this whole situation of the, the ship owners being told to, you know, yes, you are entitled to this, and sure as you have to pay up, all of this might have gone away very quietly because this wasn't a very publicly uh, prominent case. It's not like the newspapers were reporting it in any depth. But it should have just slipped away into oblivion of history like so many other of these cases, um, except for two things. Uh, there was first the factor that the insurers appealed. They actually suspected foul play on the part of the Gregson Syndicate and had suspected that the crew planned this all along, that this was a means of disposing of human cargo who was too sick to make the money back for them once they got to market. And the second factor was that some important people noticed, and they noticed the language of the judge's explanation equating human beings to horses. Now, the first person to notice this was a man named Oluada Equiano. And Equiano is going to become one of the most important people, important activists in uh, the abolition movement. Now, he started his life as, a, as an enslaved child. He was taken from the coast of Benin when he was 11 or 12 years old. And he was actually had a bit of an unusual uh, case, really, because he was purchased by a Royal Navy captain. And so he was raised up as the servant of this captain, but taught to be an able seaman. So he learned a profession. He learned a career. He was also baptized. And to many enslaved people at that time, they believed that they were baptized and they were earning a wage that they were free. And then, uh, believing this, Equiano is really double-crossed by his captain, who sells him into slavery. He's sold a third time, again, and unusually his third owner is a Quaker, who should not have owned enslaved people anyway, and obviously had some real moral qualms about it, and agreed to allow Equiano to purchase his own freedom, if he could come up with the 40 pounds that was required to pay him back. That's what he had paid for Equiano in the first place. So just imagine the difficulty of trying to scrounge penny by penny, 40 pounds to buy your own freedom. But he had the smarts, he had the, the will to make this happen, and he did. Now, what does he do with that freedom? Well, he comes back to England to become an activist and to show the horrors of the slave trade to everyone back in England. Now, after hearing about the Zong case, Equiano's first order of business is to go and inform his friend and collaborator in the movement, uh, someone who was known to be a bulldog agitator uh, for anti-slavery matters and for uh, black rights in England. And that man was Granville Sharp. Now, Sharp's got an interesting history too. He, he was born into a pretty well-connected and uh, wealthy family. His grandfather had been the Archbishop of York so the second highest cleric in the Church of England. His father was an important bishop, and the, the family had money, except for the fact that Granville was at the, the tail end of a long line of 14 children. So when it came time to educate him, there was no money left. So he was apprenticed out as a clerk, a pretty you know, boring job to be a secretary at the time, and that's exactly what he was doing when Equiano found him. He was working as a clerk in the ordinance office, so a really low-level civil servant at the time. But it gave him plenty of time to pursue other interests, and he was a smart man. This guy is an autodidact. He teaches himself Latin and Greek and philosophy and rhetoric so that he can better debate his friends at the coffee houses in London. And uh, he certainly is uh, someone you'd probably describe as a professional malcontent when it comes to issues of human rights. Um, and so when his obsession turned to the anti-slavery issue, well, then he became an amateur expert in British law, in common law, and he specially focused on issues of uh, commercial law and also issues of rights and freedoms as they related to Britain itself. And he maintained a regular correspondence with really powerful people, uh, politicians, uh, you know, anyone that he'd ever met that was in any position of importance, well, he made sure that he kept in close contact, including with people who are the governors of the new former colonies of Massachusetts. And he's always agitating for anti-slave trading movements there too. 
And he's very deeply devout, a devout Christian his whole life, and he is of the firm belief that slave trading represents a fundamental sin upon Great Britain, and it's something that is going to bring God's wrath down upon the nation. I mean, he's, he believes this. And as far as he's concerned, the loss of the colonies in the Revolutionary War is just a small taste of the horrors to come that Britain's going to face if it doesn't do something, if it doesn't protect its own soul by, by getting rid of this, this fundamental sin. Now, when he hears from Equiano that there will be an appeal on this case, he knows there'll have to be a hearing to determine the validity of a new trial. And this is going to be his opportunity to get evidence, to go to work, and that's exactly what he and Equiano do. Sharp gets himself appointed as the uh, gentleman advisor to the legal counsel representing the insurers in this appeal. Okay, he's an expert on the issues and they take all the advice they can get. And what he's encouraging them to do is not just deny the claim and say that, no, this is a fraudulent insurance claim. He's encouraging them to actually bring charges of murder against the crew of the Zong. Okay? Now, Judge Mansfield, who is presiding over this, um, this hearing as well, is doing his damnedest. He's a legal purist, especially when it comes to commercial law, which is his specialty. He is trying his hardest to, to keep the discussion within the realms of insurance law, but at every turn, the legal counsel are using the word murder uh, in this hearing to try and, and change the, the dynamic here. Now, Mansfield knows that Sharp is behind this. You know, he knows that Sharp is, is working with the legal defense team or the legal prosecution team. He is uh, also well aware of Sharp's interest in anti-slavery issues because they've crossed swords in a courtroom before, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Now, there's no transcript of the original trial that still survives, but what we do have is a transcript of the hearing because Sharp made it. He actually paid for his own legal stenographer to go and take shorthand of every word that was said during the hearing. And it's actually because of this transcript, Sharp's transcript, that still survives, that we know about the words that Mansfield used in the original trial because he had to reread the decision. And so that equation of uh, human beings to horses, it gets repeated here, and that's where we have the, the copy of it. Now, Mansfield and his fellow judges, there were three of them in all, agreed that there was grounds for a new trial because new evidence had come to light. Very conveniently in the original trial, uh, they had left out the details that it had rained between uh, the second and the third group of killings that took place. And so, yes, Mansfield says, oh, well, if it rained, well, that changes everything, and yes, we do need to have a new trial. Now, the Gregson Syndicate at this point feels that the tide of legal opinion has turned against them, and they decline to pursue a second trial. And here again is a point where the whole thing could have just lapsed into you know, the dark tunnel of history, except for the continued efforts of Sharp and Equiano, which did not let up. They used the transcript to write to everyone, everyone they knew, uh, about the horrors of what had happened on board, about the bold-faced greed that was being displayed by English slave traders, and about the, the terrible language that is being used in discussions of slave trading. And they're writing to people like the Lord's Commissioners of the Admiralty, the head of the Navy. Now, why would you do that? Well, because it's the Lord's Commissioners of the Admiralty that oversee charges of murder at sea, right? But he's writing to every high church cleric, every member of parliament, every professor at a university, anyone he can think of who might have some sort of influence to start changing general opinions here. And, um, of course, bringing up the idea always that the soul of Britain is at stake. Something has to be done. So this minimal impact on the public is certainly something that is worth noting. The newspapers are not very effective at communicating all of this to the, the average person in England. But that's not where Sharp is really aiming his, his arrows. Where he's aiming at is at the highest levels of society, at, at the elites who might actually be able to affect change on a legislative level. And uh, in fact, one of the most fruitful seeds that is planted here is actually in the universities, because one of the good friends of Granville Sharp 
uh, he has two friends actually at Cambridge. He's got a friend who's the master of Trinity College and another who's the master of Magdalen College. And the master of Magdalen is this guy, Peter Peckard, and uh, he has a huge following. He's already a very big anti-slavery activist. His students love him. They come to his lectures, you know, and uh, they want to hear what he has to say. He's actually the man who's also responsible for coming up with the most famous uh, slogan of the abolition movement, the, the am I not a man and a brother, and this image and there's these words will appear on lots of different things uh, to do with abolition over the next decades, from teapots to plates and everything else. But with Peckard's work being done at Magdalen College, one of his students, Thomas Clarkson, is going to be one of the most important because he will be the foot soldier, the hardworking foot soldier of the abolition movement. His idea is to go around and collect as much evidence as possible. He's talking to formerly enslaved people, to uh, crew members, captains of slave ships, getting their testimony, getting evidence that can be presented, and his evidence, along with published accounts that are now starting to appear, and all of this is kicking off in 1787. That's when it officially gets going, just four years after the Zong case, when all of this is really rolling, and we get the publication of narratives by Equiano and other formerly enslaved people, like Otaba Kugano, who is publishing his narrative, and these are, these are still available. You know, they're still out there. They became bestsellers in their day. And together with this, these narratives, with public presentations in meeting houses that have been given to standing room only crowds, to ministers who are taking up the cause in the pulpits, you're starting to get a groundswell of a movement that is rapidly changing public sentiment, far more than any newspaper article would have ever done. So the story of the Zong, even years later, is never far from the lips of the agitators who are there. And then the next move is to get it into Parliament. And this is where Wil William Wilberforce comes into play, Wilberforce being a member of Parliament who is going to represent the abolition position and try and, and start the ball rolling to change legislation here. Now, the efforts of all of these people are working to again, start a, a tide that will not be able to turn around. It will be so great that the momentum will be unstoppable. Now, not just at the highest levels of society and in politics is this effect noticed. It's also noticed at the lowest levels of society too. There are black men and women in Britain, both free, working as, in, uh, as servants, and enslaved people too, who start to make protests in the only ways that they can. And what many are using is a precedent that has been set by Judge Mansfield himself, ironically, in a case that came in 1772. And Granville Sharp got involved. It involved this man. That's the only image we have of him. His name is James Somerset, a formerly enslaved man. And Somerset had run away from his owner in Britain He'd been captured, and the owner was so angry that he was going to send him back to Jamaica and sell him. And Granville Sharp got a hold of this case, organized a defense team for Somerset, and Judge Mansfield actually decided that, yes, there is, in fact, no common law precedent that allows for slavery on British soil. Right? So using this precedent, a lot of uh, black people enslaved black people in England decide this is it, this is our chance, and they start moving away. It's a protest in a form of, of movement away from their enslaved captors, and it was very effective. And then there were the petitions, right? Uh, there are all sorts of activists going all around the country gathering signatures from top to bottom of Britain, uh, 60,000 names, 100,000 names that Wilberforce presents in the House of Commons, and the average Briton by this stage in the mid-1790s on the streets of London or Liverpool or Glasgow could not ignore this groundswell. And then on top of this, we have the actions of black men and women acting on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, here in Saint-Domingue, the impossible happened in 1791. We see uh, enslaved people rising up and starting a war that will result in the establishment of the first free society built on the ashes of a slave colony. And 
this is thanks in large part to the efforts of Toussaint Louverture and other leaders of this movement, but it is hard to overstate the fear that this rebellion, this revolution in Haiti, instilled in the hearts of every planter in the British West Indies. And it's this fear of continued rolling revolution in the sugar colonies that is actually going to help change the minds of even the most hardened politicians back in, in Britain. Uh, politicians who were completely inured to the idea of a moral argument or a religious argument. They were pragmatists and they were more concerned with a commercial argument. What they are seeing is that this is the new threat. This is the real problem. And what it's, it's coming from, they believed, was the influx of new African blood. They believed that rebellions were stirred by the new imports of Africans coming from the homeland and coming into these Creole established slave societies. And so that becomes their reason to get behind the slave trade, uh, the, the, the Abolition Act, sorry, for the slave trade. And so, you know, the emergence of a free wage labor system is ultimately going to be the outgrowth of this too. I think most politicians by the turn of the century really understand the fact that this is not sustainable. We can't keep going in this way. And a big part of the problem, as the metropole politicians saw it, you get this real division starting between the metropole and the colonies. They start to see British character in the colonies as tainted, that metropolitan Britons are good and pure and moral people, whereas those Englishmen over in the colonies are brutalized by slavery that there is something tainted about them by the violence that they have to commit every day. And so we start to see cartoons like this, a political cartoon that actually comes from a news story that happened in 1791, uh, in which an English driver on one of the plantations uh, was so angry at one of these young kids on the plantation because he was sick and he couldn't work, that he whipped him within an inch of his life and then threw him into a boiling vat of sugar juice. And what is insane is that this child survived and uh, wasn't really functional for the next six months, but nonetheless, it became a real cause celeb to kind of get behind back in Britain itself. Now, I do want to be careful here because this is not a united front in the anti-slavery movement. You have to consider the fact that sugar is such an enormous industry that the men running the, the plantocracies in the, in the West Indies are the Elon Musk's, the, the Bill Gates of their day. And that kind of money buys enormous political support. The slave lobby was incredibly powerful in Parliament. And that's why it takes 20 years of work from 1787 to get us to the point where the act for the abolition of the slave trade actually goes through in 1807. And it might sound like something of a moment of victory, but even this rings rather hollow because when you consider that, okay, the British got rid of the slave trade in 1807 and America followed suit in 1808, well, there were other countries who did not. Now, Spain and Portugal are going to continue unabated, shipping huge numbers of Africans uh, across the Atlantic. In fact, the last official slave ships are going to arrive in Brazil in 1888. That's the official ones. And there's good evidence to suggest, too, that, in fact, uh, the passage of the Abolition Acts in Britain and in the United States actually increased the number of murders taking place on board these ships because if Spanish or Portuguese slave traders thought they were about to be boarded by a British or a, a U.S. naval vessel and arrested, well, then they got rid of the evidence. They threw people overboard to their deaths. So if that's the case, if the Zong did not stop the slave trade immediately, and if it didn't stop the murders of Africans in the same method that was being used against that ship, then why did it matter? Well, it mattered because it was the case that armed the efforts, the obsessive efforts of activists like Sharp and Equiano with a story that was so universally appalling, not just for its cruelty, but for the greed that it brought to common knowledge and that written judgment that so coldly equated human beings to beasts of burden. And it was so strong that no one could turn away from this. Right? You couldn't pretend it wasn't happening. And it put the matters front and center in Britain itself. You know, unlike in America or in the Caribbean, 
Uh, you could pretend that slavery wasn't real if you were in Britain. You know, the average Englishman didn't think for a minute about where the sugar in his tea came from or where the, the, the tobacco in his pipe was produced. But this was something that you couldn't ignore. And although most people couldn't deny that they knew something of the evils of slavery, it was hidden, it was out of sight, it was over there, out of sight and out of mind. But the, the Zong changed that. It put it right back in front of Britain's faces. And for a few, it was a true epiphany. You know, it was a real conversion, a belief in the necessary freedom of all human beings and the equality of all human beings. For others, it wasn't quite that. It was less about black suffering and more about fears for the future of English morality, and that's an important, important distinction to make. But the outcome, however, was the same. The Zong spurred that next wave of the movement, which was exponentially larger than anything that had come before. And ultimately, I think we can look at the deaths of the 132 men, women, and children aboard the Zong as the moment at which the abolition movement was given birth. Thank you.